And so I want to share with you uh, three messages from the same subject, but it'll be three different parts today. I want to talk to you about standing for truth in the era of lies. Standing for truth in the era of lies. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, very familiar to you all. I'm using the New King James Version, but it says, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. You know that the core of all of that that God hates is about lying and deception? A lying tongue. Because you've got to lie and deceive in order to do these other things. And then a false witness who speaks lies. One who sows discord among brethren. All of this goes back to the issue of deception, of lying. And really, we are in an era of lies today. It's unlike anything I've ever seen since I've been following the political and social developments of our country. If there's one thing that characterizes it, I would say at the core of it, in spite of all the other immoral things we see and hear, at the core of it is lying. Lying. And, and the Bible teaches us, right, that the mark of the Antichrist is going to be lies. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all powers, signs, and lying wonders. Now, I want you to notice something. It doesn't say that the reign of the lawless one, because the lawless one is referring to the Antichrist, doesn't say his reign, it says his coming, which implies that lies paved the way for his ascension. So, you know, you think about in the same way that John the Baptist paved the way for the revelation of Jesus Christ by what? Proclaiming truth to a nation that had been accustomed to hearing a lot of lies and traditions. He paved the way for the Messiah with truth. Well, the way is going to be paved for the Antichrist with lies. Giving people a taste for lies, a taste for deception. Have you ever tried something new, maybe some food, some dessert, and you weren't sure how you felt about it. Maybe you didn't think you liked it that much, but over time, you developed a taste for it and then came to realize, you know, actually, I like that. Well, you know, that's what the devil's trying to do with lies. He's trying to develop in people a taste, an affinity for, an affection for, an attraction to lies. That text goes on to say, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And that word pleasure in unrighteous, unrighteousness means they considered themselves to be doing good and enjoyed it. And that's where we are today. People are doing evil, considering them themselves to be doing good, and they are enjoying it. And it says they did not receive the love of the truth. Now that word receive in the Greek means they did not take hold of truth. They did not grasp the love of truth. They, they did not reach out for truth. They did not want truth. To, 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 to want something, to, to, to the word of God, for example, the truth, is to hear it, to meditate in it, to do it, to proclaim it. Well, that's what the world is doing with lies. They're hearing it. They've got itching ears. They're hearing it. They're meditating in it, ruminating in it, and then they're doing it, and then they're proclaiming it and promoting it to the world that this is the way to go. So my brothers and sisters, we are in an era of lies. And if you love the truth, if you love the truth, you've got to hate lies. You've got to hate lies. Jesus told those who opposed him, he said, you are of your father the devil. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. He said, he loves lies and so do you. 
If you love God, if you love truth, you've got to hate lies. Our Father, our God, is the truth. And if you love him, it means you love the truth. And we should have a passionate desire and attraction, a, a, a desire to do everything possible to promote and to exalt truth because that's exactly what Jesus was doing. And that's what we ought to be doing. Proverbs 13, 5 says, a righteous man hates lying, hates it. We should have that same attitude that we hate lies. Now look, we don't hate people. We love people, but we hate lies. We don't want to destroy people, but we ought to want to destroy lies. We ought to want to explode them. We ought to want to discredit them. We ought to want to make them so obviously contemptible that people hear it and they reject it out of hand. That's where we've got to go if we're going to save this country. Psalm 119 verses 104 and 128 say essentially the same thing. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. 128 says, therefore, all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. Therefore, I hate every false way. In fact, the old covenant pronounces a blessing upon those who love truth. Psalm 24, 3 through 5 says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol or to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Even the old covenant taught people that when you approach God, you need to have a pure heart, a heart that is committed to truth, not a heart that is committed to deception or swearing deceitfully. The new covenant confirms this in 2 Corinthians 4, 2. It says, we have renounced the hidden things of the old King James says dishonesty. New King James says shame, but the better translation really is dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And Andrew dealt with conscience last night, that appealing to that, that sense of conscience in them that has an attraction to truth. So in the time we've got, in the next three messages I've got today and tonight and tomorrow morning, I want to talk to you about the big lies. The big lies that are plaguing our society and what we as the body of Christ should do about it. Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, if you abide in my word, then are you my disciples indeed and you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Make you free. Well, my brothers, the corollary is also true. When you know lies, when you abide in lies, you are in bondage. Lies make you captive in the same way truth sets you free. The Israelites wanted to go back to Egypt. You know why? Because the lie was still alive in them. You know, that golden calf did us good. And you know, at least we could eat in Egypt. At least we were fed in Egypt. At least we knew where we were going in Egypt, which was nowhere. <laughs> See, the truth of God liberates you for the present and the future, the lies of the devil drag you back into a past of bitterness and impoverishness, impoverishment and, and, and hatred and, and, and disdain for life. I mean, the fact that they wanted to go back to Egypt meant that they had no value in themselves. And my brothers and sisters, the lies of the devil will always rob people of their true value so that they can be controlled by him. Are you all hearing me today? Yeah. Jesus in his first sermon said he came, among other things, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And John 8, 36 says, therefore, if the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now think about this. 
the most evil, murderous, genocidal ideologies in the history of mankind have always promised people liberation. Communism, liberation. Socialism, liberation. But the fact of the matter is it provides exactly the opposite. No freedom of speech, no freedom of conscience, no freedom of movement. You notice in communist societies, people can't leave, they have to escape. It is a form of slavery. I am always amazed by the left in our country because they are railing constantly about the slavery that ended 150 years ago in America, and yet they are promoting a far more pernicious form of slavery, Marxism and communism and socialism, because that turns the whole society into a slave state. Every Chinese person living under the communist regime of China is a slave. I don't care how rich they are, I don't care how poor they are, I don't care who they are, they are a slave. And if you don't believe it, get out of line and find out what happens to you. Billionaires disappear in China because they dare to contradict the regime. And my brothers and sisters, I was watching an interview of a scientist who was being questioned about COVID. And, and the interviewer kept saying, you know, you, you've talked about the, the, the scientific consensus. You talked about how you, you have to reach consensus. And then he asked him this question. He said, but what about the individual scientist who questions the consensus? This American scientist being interviewed by an American interviewer answered in a way that says it all. He said, the individual doesn't matter. The individual doesn't matter. That's communism. That's Marxism. That's socialism. Because in God's eyes, the individual matters supremely. God loves every single one of us. Each one of us matters to him. And each one of us is ultimately accountable to him for our own actions. So the reason why America in spite of the lies, and I'm going to get into this a little bit, but in spite of the lies about America, oh, America was built on slavery. America stole the land. That's why America's prospered. No, America's prospered because of the freedom of the individual to contradict and question the consensus and to dream beyond what anybody has known before. That's why George Washington Carver was able to, cut, to find 300 different uses of the peanut. Because he wasn't bound by what others had said or done. He went to God and asked God to reveal this thing. And God just one, gave him one thing after another. And this man became one of the most renowned scientists in America. This black man in America that everybody tells us. By the way, the only revolution in the world that ever f gave people more freedom than prior to the revolution is the American Revolution. Every other revolution, including those in Europe, the French Revolution was bathed in blood. Robespierre is known to have guillotine, that means cut the head off of somewhere around 15,000 people, and that does include all the other people who were murdered, giving people liberty. Only in America did people end up more free. You say, well, what, women couldn't vote, true. People with property couldn't vote, true. There still was slavery, true. But we inherited a legacy that would allow us all to ultimately experience the blessings of freedom. Because when the founding fathers penned the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They were creating a unique nation unlike any other, and you and I are the beneficiaries and inheritors of that liberty that they proclaim. So I want to share with you then three big lies and what we do about them. Here's the first big lie. 
that is pervading our culture. America is built on white supremacy. Oh, that's, that's being taught in our colleges, our universities, everywhere. Uh, they call it now systemic racism, which means that you can't prove it, you can't find it, you can't get evidence of it, but it's there because we say it's there. And it's there because America is just hopelessly white supremacist. Now, the 1619 Project codifies this lie by saying that America was settled for the purpose of establishing slavery in this continent. That's what the 1619 Project says. Um, this woman, Nicole Jones, is running around making tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars pr promoting this lie. Here's the truth of the matter. Now, I'm not a historical expert, but I'm a student of history. Number one, the first settlements in Plymouth and Jamestown were spurred on by different motivations neither one of them having anything to do with slavery. The first British subjects to arrive in this continent from England, now you may have never heard this before and, and therefore never thought about it, but think about this. For people who say America was settled for the purpose of advancing slavery, the Mayflower, the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, the Discovery, first four ships to come didn't have a single slave. Slavery already existed in England and in many of England's colonies. But the people who first came here didn't bring a single slave. Stop and think about that for a moment. And some of the people, particularly um, in the Virginia Company, which is what brought them to Jamestown, some of those people were what we call gentlemen. In other words, they had money, they had means. But they didn't bring a single slave. Now, of course, the, the Jamestown settlement landed in 1607. 13 years or 12 years later, approximately, the first ships arrived that brought slaves. And they got here by accident. They weren't ordered. The Portuguese had captured slaves in Africa, put them on the San Juan Batista headed for Spain. They encountered two pirate ships that were manned by British pirates. They plundered the, the cargo of the San Juan Batista, destroyed that ship, and those two ships, the White Lion and the Treasurer, both of which ended up landing in Virginia. Now when they got here, they didn't come here to bring Slaves. They didn't come here to bring Africans. The Africans who sl stayed here were only part of their cargo, stayed here because they needed to trade something for food and supplies and they had no money. And so they traded some of these Africans as part of what they had to offer the colonists. Now because there were no slaves in the North American continent at the time, none, you didn't have a slave system. Now, slavery did exist, and British was participating in it, and other European countries were, but the colonists were not. So what do we do? Well, they made them indentured servants to pay back what it cost them to, to, to trade with the supplies that they gave to the captains of the treasurer and the, the, um, the white lion, who then, of course, took off for Bermuda to take the rest of their cargo into slavery. But the people who landed here, the Africans who stayed here, ended up here by accident and were not intergenerational slaves. They were made indentured servants just like Europeans. Now, a lot of people don't want to admit this, but they became indentured servants. They served seven years just like people from, from Ireland, from Germany, from other parts of Europe. And at the end of that period, they ended up getting a 50 acre grant of land, the most famous of which is a, is a, a former indentured servant by the name of Anthony Johnson, who was from Angola, as all of these slaves were. He ended up parlaying that into a 250 acre estate in, uh, um, on Eastern Shore, Virginia. And by the way, black man, African, 
from Angola owned black slaves. In fact, he was the one who sued a slave uh, by the name of um, John Kasor because he said that he had served his time as an indentured servant and wanted to be released. And Anthony Johnson, his name formerly was Antonio, but Anthony Johnson said, no, you have not served your time, sued in court, and the judge punished John Kasor by making him the lifetime slave of another black man by the name of Anthony Johnson. Now, you won't hear that history in the colleges or public schools. But the beginning of what we call slavery in this country, in this continent, was accidental. Now, as more and more Africans were brought here, the system began because the labor became so important and because of a couple of incidents that happened, uh, Bacon's Rebellion being one, um, Nathaniel Bacon assembled a bunch of slaves and indentured servants uh, of, and, and some Native Americans and they came against Governor Barkley because they felt that he was misusing them and abusing them and not protecting them uh, against some of the more aggressive Native Americans who were plundering their land. Nathaniel Bacon raised up a, a, a kind of a revolution against Governor Barkley and it was a mixed race deal. Well, needless to say, the slave master said, we can't have this. We can't have Europeans and Africans and Native Americans all getting together and trying to deal with whatever injustice they have against us. And that was the inspiration for the first slave codes. Now, my brothers and sisters, none of that is based upon white supremacy. It's based upon the circumstances of history. And they want to say the Revolutionary War was fought to preserve slavery. Another palpable lie. Because the fact of the matter is the Revolutionary War was started as a result of England and King George's incessant and unyielding demands of the colonists and wanting to use them in order to enrich himself. I mean, it began all the way back with the, with the, uh, the Stamp Act. Of course, as you all, I'm sure you've heard of that. And, and, uh, and then there was the, the, the Intolerable Acts, which included the Tea Act, which caused the Boston Tea Party to arise. There was just a long series, just like the Declaration of Independence says, of usurpations, and none of them had anything to do with slavery. Not a one. And when Thomas Jefferson wrote the first draft of the Declaration of Independence, he included in a, de a denunciation of slavery, and Georgia and South Carolina made him take it out because they said, no, we depend too much on slavery. We're not including that. And in order to hold the 13 colonies together, they dropped that language because whether you know it or not, and here again, you won't hear this much either, but as a younger man, Thomas Jefferson was vehemently opposed to slavery, but frankly, he got beat down. Because those who depended upon slave labor told him, shut up if you want a political career. And he began to back off. But of course, as he got older, he came back again, beginning to talk about the importance of getting rid of slavery. And he predicted that if we didn't do something about it, it was going to end in bloodshed. And he wasn't the first to do it. He wasn't the first to predict it. My brothers and sisters, what I'm getting at is these are lies. They're lies out of the pit of hell. And listen, why are these lies being told? They're being told because if you can convince people that the very founding of America is inherently evil and inherently wrong, then maybe you can convince them that the system needs to be torn down and rebuilt again. You can convince them that we can do away with the Declaration of Independence, that we can do away with the Constitution, and we can rebuild it in a different image. But my brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you that in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus over this country and this nation. We'll never give up being a constitutional republic. We will never give up our liberty. We will never give up the God, God's blessing upon our nation. We're going to fight for America to remain the land of the free and the home of the brave, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all.
The era of lies. Here's the second big lie. You ready for this one? All white people are evil oppressors and all people of color are virtuous victims. Now, first of all, as a footnote, I have never met a single human being who didn't have color. Have you? <laughs> Not a one. Not a one. This, this artificial construct, people of color, is really meant to be a divisive and manipulative attempt to divide people of, from, of a certain background from everybody else and to manipulate the people who are, are darker skin to be convinced that the people with lighter skin are your enemy. That in itself is another big lie. People of color. We've all got it. Hallelujah. Some of us are little beige and reddish and some of us are darker skin, but, but, and it ranges all over the place. But praise God, Dr. King ought to be remembered more than anything else for saying we should not be judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. Look, what this is really trying to do is impose collective guilt and collective virtue. Nobody is guilty of anything by virtue of being a member of a demographic. And notice how selectively this is applied. Because look, this is not a happy statistic and I don't take any joy in saying it, but 52% of the murders in America are committed by 6% of the population and that is black men, primarily young black men. Am I responsible for that? No. But people might want to smear me with that, but notice what the left does. They want to take the past, they want to take any incident they can find or make up, and they are great in the imagination of how, oh my God, I, I'm amazed. I mean, we, have, we had a teacher in Virginia who said that the idea that you should go to class, that you should sit up, that you should listen, that you should obey, obey your teacher, he said, those are ideas of white supremacy. And I said, oh my goodness, I didn't know my daddy was a white supremacist. <laughs> so they'll just make stuff up. But there's no such thing as collective guilt for the behavior of people in the past or for the behavior of anybody in the present. You know, Romans 3, 10 through 12, you're very familiar, says, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. This is talking about without Christ. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. I don't see any racial classifications there, do you? We're all, without Christ, under the same condemnation. And with Christ, we are all subject to the same glorification and exaltation. Your skin color doesn't get you anywhere. Not with God. I mean, is anybody gonna stand before God and say, nah, Lord, help a brother out. <laughs> or, or, now Lord, where is my white privilege? <laughs> no, what can wash away my sin? <laughs> Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Look, even the old covenant denounced that and predicted that that attitude that uh, there's somehow some collective guilt would be, would God would bring that to an end. Jeremiah 31, beginning at verse 29 says, in those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. 
The notion that people are guilty because of some collective activity by somebody else is a wicked and evil notion. And it is dangerous, my brothers and sisters. It is dangerous. It leads to the inevitable conclusion that if you can identify the group that is the problem, maybe you just ought to get rid of them. Because you know that's what's happened in human history. That's what the Hutus did to the Tutsis in Rwanda. They said, the Tutsis are our problem. And let's pick a day. Oh, and by the way, you know all this stuff about looks like me? Well, they look like each other. Once again, right, Andrew, it's not the skin, it's the sin. And they shipped in machetes by the hundreds of thousands and picked a day when they would begin to slaughter every Tutsi they found. Men, women, and children, they created a bloodbath in that nation of bodies chopped up and left everywhere because they said, since the Tutsis are our problem, we got to get rid of them. By the way, they call them cockroaches and told people, don't think any more of killing one of them than you do of killing a cockroach. It's exactly what the Turkish Muslims did to the Armenian Christians. I know we're not allowed to say that in the American government because the, 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 the Turkish Muslims get upset about that. But that was a slaughter of Christians because the Turks became convinced that the Armenians were their problem. Just get rid of them. And they kill 1.5 million Armenians. And that's exactly what Hitler did in Germany. Convince the German people the Jews are our problem. You know, if we could just get rid of them, all oh, things will just be wonderful in Germany. In fact, they'll be wonderful in the world and set about to kill 6 million Jews. Now, I don't think that I'm exaggerating this. The demographics may militate against it a bit, but when I hear this stuff, white people this and white people that and, and, and get rid of your whiteness, I'm hearing echoes of the same sentiment. That some, they are the problem. And if we can just deal with them, everything will be fine. This is demonic, my brothers and sisters. It is demonic. Not to mention that it ought to scream loudly that this is exactly what was done to black folks in the, in the segregated South. It was exactly what's been done to other people who've been the subject of genocide. Why in the world are we repeating the same mindset, the same mentality? I'm telling you, you and I, have got to, without apology or equivocation or compromise, say this is a lie out of the pit of hell and I'm not making any apology for standing up for people as my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and my fellow human beings and we're not going to smear people in that way. Amen. Glory to God. My father, my father taught me something as a young boy that I'll never forget. Uh, my father was a hobo during the Depression. And, um, of course, he was born in 1915, much different era than anything I've ever seen. But he said when they would ride the, and you all know hobos weren't homeless people. They were people riding the rails looking for work. He said he would get off a train, and there'd be people of all different backgrounds. And he said sometimes they have to cross through somebody's backyard, going into a town trying to look for work. Just, can I sweep a floor? Can I... Can I paint a house? And, and, and people would have, who had some means, who were doing okay, would have sandwiches and lemonade out. And they would tell all the hobos coming by, come on up, come on up, we got some food for you. And they would feed him. He said, and nobody ever cared about the color of my skin. We were all in it together. And my father taught me something. By the way, he told me, he said, that's the first time I ate a fat back sandwich. He said, but when you're hungry, a fat back sandwich tastes pretty good. But you see, they, they recognize when it comes right down to it, we all bleed the same red blood. We all want to take care of our families and meet our responsibilities. We all want to live our lives in the very best way we can. 
and, they, and, and my brothers and sisters, that's what I know about America. I've traveled this country and I refuse to believe, based upon what I've seen, that the American people are racist. I found integrity and honor and compassion and decency and love and goodwill all over this nation. That's what we've got to tap into. That's what we've got to remind people of. That's who we are as a nation. America wasn't built on any of this garbage that they're asserting it was built on. America was built on faith in God. That's the truth of the matter. George Washington, in his first proclamation, it was a Thanksgiving proclamation, said, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and to humbly implore his favor and protection. That's our country. That's the father of our nation. That's who we are. Ben Franklin, during the great convention to establish our Constitution, when they had reached an impasse, stood up and said, the longer I live, the more convincing proof I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall from the sky without his acknowledgement, is it possible that an empire can rise without his aid? He said, we read in the Holy Scriptures, and I believe this, that unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. He said, and I am convinced that without his concurring aid, we will be no more successful in building this house than they were in building the Tower of Babel. That's our country. That's who we are. Abraham Lincoln, in a, in a proclamation calling the nation to fast and pray, said the following, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers and wealth and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pay, pray to the God that made us. He said it behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. That's my country. I live in a godly nation. I live in a nation that's rooted and grounded in faith in Almighty God. And that's been the key to our success. It has not been race. It has not been our brilliance. It's not our, in, our, our, our enhanced genetics. We're not superior people, but we were based upon superior values. And those values have brought us almost a quarter of a millennium as the most powerful and most successful nation in the world. And the thing that is most threatening to this country is not communist China, it's not Russia, it's the erosion from within of people who want to supplant faith in God with faith in government, who want to destroy those foundational principles that made America great. And we are not going to let them do it. We have got to be warriors for truth. We've got to love truth and hate lies. I don't hate a homosexual. I don't hate a transgender. I don't hate an abortionist. But I hate the lies that they're propagating in this country. And I'm going to stand up against those lies. I don't care what they say. They can call me every name in the book. You know, that song says, you can talk about me as much as you please, but the more you talk, I'm going to stay on my knees. And when I get up, I'm going to hit you between the eyes with the word of God. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought under obedience to Jesus Christ. Oh... Let me wrap this up. Here's the third big lie. The third big lie, your skin color determines your identity and your destiny. This is a big lie. It's a big lie to convince people that they really have no hope, except in some kind of rescue. And there's a part 
daddy that promises they'll rescue you. Nothing ever gets any better. But they promise you that they're going to rescue you. Or the government becoming God and the government's going to take care of you. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the government has done for the black community. Because it's not pretty over the last generation and a half. But you see, this is a tool of political manipulation again to keep people under control, to keep them in bondage. People say to me, well, why, why are you so conservative? You know why I'm conservative? I'm conservative because I'm the son of a proud black man who taught me to stand on my own two feet, who taught me nobody owes me anything, who taught me go out there and work for what you want, and you don't have to who taught me, son, reach for the stars. Because even if you don't get there, you'll land on the moon, but you'll do a lot better than if you don't reach at all. Who taught me, when you come against obstacles, go over them, under them, around or through them, but don't let anybody stop you from fulfilling what you believe to be your destiny in life. You go out there and get it. You go out there and do it. That's where it comes from. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about my background in the next message. But my father taught me that my destiny is in my own hands. But my heavenly father taught me that my destiny can be put in his hands. Yeah. Hallelujah. I put my destiny in my heavenly father's hands. And the word of God teaches me for those whom he did foreknow, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I tell people all the time, I'm a child of the King. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. You can't stop me from fulfilling my destiny in Christ. What in the world do I have to be worried about? He opens doors and no one can close them. Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west or the south, but God is the judge who raises up one and puts down another. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So then, what you... Who, if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? For I am persuaded that neither death, nor light, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor anything else in all creation, not death, not life, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. I know in whom I have believed, and I know that he's able to keep me. That's why my brothers and sisters, I didn't come here to preach to you. Put your hope in the Republican Party. Put your hope in a Harvard Law degree. Put your hope in your pedigree. Put your hope in your race. But my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. He's a rock in a weary land. He's a shelter in a time of storm. He's a friend on every hand. Do I have a witness here? Hallelujah. Jesus, my rock. Jesus, my hope. Jesus, my strength. Jesus, my joy. Jesus, my everything, my all in all. Do I have a witness here? Has he been good to you? Has he been kind? Has he been merciful? He's given us everything, including the United States of America, and the devil can't take what God has given us if we won't give it up. I read the back, the beginning, and the middle of the book, and we win. Yeah. 